Good morning, everybody. It's actually, it's, it's really, I, I would like to thank our current administration for generating so much interest in a topic. <laughs> so, in fact, actually, I think I heard it mentioned as confusion earlier and as something else. So, um, we're excited today. Chuck McDonald, uh, th this is a first in a, in a couple of areas. You're actually our first return guest. All right. Good. Good. All right. Certain last time Chuck was here, he said, Once this occurs, everything I'm saying now, please ignore it. So, um, I'm back. but just a just a quick introduction for Chuck. He is actually a shareholder with the Greenville Law Office. He's been working in employment, specifically employment law, for the past 19 years. Uh, Chuck and Ogletree have been friends of HTI for a very long time, and they are always fantastic. Whenever there's a new legislation coming down, especially something that has clearly the impact that this is going to have. Um, you guys always do a great job of helping us sort of sort out the sort out the bits and figure out how we're going to handle it. Um, what we want to do: a couple quick things to announce before we get started. Uh, you have some information that was given to you today. Uh, you have a document about our next month's event, which will be July first, and we're actually going to be talking about the legalization of marijuana and how it's going to be in the workplace. Especially for those of us working here in the upstate, uh, we're. we're Border on Georgia and North Carolina, and I'm sure you've got employees that live in multiple places. What if these border states get what we do, or vice versa? How do we handle those types of issues? Um, we also, for anything, for anyone, we've had a couple questions. We stream all of these events. So if you ever can join us, uh, if you watch the invites, there will be a link to a streaming feed. Also, a phone number where you can call in and even ask questions if you want to. Uh, also, any of the events that we do, we record and we have a YouTube channel. So what we will do after this event today is we will send you out a link. So if you have, if you want to watch any of the past events that we've done, uh, you're more than welcome to, and this will be up. But if you want to share it with anyone else, please do. Um, you know we've got a lot to cover this morning, so I'm going to turn it over to Chuck. But once again, thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning. All right. Nobody told me I was on YouTube, but all right. <laughs> so last time they said it was jeans Friday, and I wore suit pants. This time I wore jeans. Um, I, will, I tend to be a pacer, so I will get up and walk around, but last time I sat in this stool because I wasn't really sure how wide the video camera was, so I wasn't sure if I could move. I've now been told I have a little, a little bit of motion range. So, uh, Last time I spoke, for those of y'all who listened to me on the broadcast or the recording later or were here, um, I told you what I thought was going to happen. About half of what I thought was going to happen happened. And uh, we now have the regulations out. Uh, I'll go ahead and start in reverse order because I've been doing this long enough over the past two and a half weeks. Other than a few handbook reviews, I would guess that 70% of what I've done the last two and a half weeks has been talking about these FLSA regulations. So um, I, I can talk about them. I'm comfortable with them. If y'all have questions, raise your hands as we go through. I'm not worried about you interrupting me. As far as I'm concerned, we're in jeans. It's Friday morning. Let's be interactive and let me do what I can to help y'all understand these regs and you can go apply them in your business. But I'll start in reverse order because everybody always asks me, well, you know, are these really going to be effective decent one and is Congress going to do anything? And the answer to all that is stuff's going to get, you know, legislation is going to get proposed. It's already been proposed. Somebody out there may file a lawsuit. But I can guarantee you in an election year with Congress not even in session and a lot of congressmen and women were up for re-election, nothing is going to rock the boat between now and December 1st. So you need to prepare for these regs to take that on December 1st. Now, what may happen next year or with our new president or depending on which party controls you know, Congress, we'll, we'll, you know, that, that's a different story. So whether or not these things could change or get tweaked in a year or two years or something like that uh, very well could be, uh, but for now, I think we need to operate under the uh, assumption that these are going to take effect December 1. And to be honest with you, the Department of Labor did what I 
thought they would do and give longer than the 60 days notice they're required to give under the Administrative Procedures Act because they knew this was going to impact a lot of employers. Now, certain employers are going to get impacted more than others, but I think they knew small businesses, nonprofit, governmental entities were really going to get hit hard by this increase in the minimum salary. And so they wanted to give enough time for employers to kind of get their ducks in a row, if you will. Uh, hopefully some of y'all have been thinking about these and looking at how many jobs you got that are under, at the time we thought it might be 50,000, it's 47,476, and figuring out how much of an adjustment you may have to make for your particular business. Uh, but either way, they've given us about six months to get ready, so that's about as good as you're going to get from the federal government. So uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, and your political aspirations, and I'm not going to get into politics because, quite frankly, I prefer to just not even deal with it, but that's just my personal opinion. You either are going to get the perspective that, man, we got you know about as good as we could get from these regs, or you're going to get the perspective of, well, the Department of Labor did ex They went all the way up to the absolute maximum they could go without getting in really a lot of trouble. Uh, so depending on what your perspective is, uh, but, but at the end of the day, they were going to go at 50,000. They're at 47,476. I'll talk about how we got there. We were going to have an automatic adjustment every year. Instead, we have an automatic adjustment every three years. I think that's a big win for employers. It gives you some ability to, to make your decisions as far as employees pay and know that you can kind of stick with it for at least a three-year term. And let's be honest, in this climate, economic climate we're in, three years is a pretty long time when you're talking about a business. So that's a lot better than 12 months. You already have planning two months into the year what you're going to be doing the next, you know, the next 10, 9, 10 months. So that three year, uh, I think, was really helpful to employers. Um, you did get the 10% you know, incentive that we'll talk about. I think it's, I think it'll benefit those employers that already have some kind of commission or bonus plan in place, but for others, um, I don't recommend you try to even mess with it. I just think it can get more complicated and be administratively more difficult for you if you don't already have one in place. Um, so let's talk just briefly. Remember, President Obama sent a memorandum to the Department of Labor in 2014 saying he wanted the Department of Labor to uh, look at the regs and to make recommendations to revise the regulations to streamline the exemption test under the guise that there needs to be more people who are getting overtime. Now, when you look at what the current minimum salary is of 23660 let's be honest, it's a low number. It needed to go up. The problem is normally you don't go more than double what a current salary is in one full suite. So when the proposed regs came out, a lot of people were like, well, hey, wait, what happened to like, you know, when the minimum wage goes up, you go in three-year steps, you know, where's the step? So I know some employers are writing comments in trying to say, hey, this ought to be step. There ought to be a step increase here. I think the compromise we got is is going up in one full swoop. They're giving you six months, and then the automatic increase instead of being one year is three years. And again, there is compromise here because the Department of Labor wants these things to pass. They wanted to get as much as they could get across, but they know that if they push it too much, they're going to get real serious challenges. The other thing we got is no change to the primary duties test. So that, that's important. That's a, that's a big, because I was telling employers, if, if they increase the salary more than double and they change the primary duty test to give a percentage calculation, now you've got a double whammy. You really do have to go back and really look at job positions and look at those primary duty tests. And it was just going to be a bigger effort to really try to get in compliance. Um, by not messing with the primary duty test, what they basically said is, you know, we, but we believe that the, that the salary is the best or one of the best factors for determining exempt status, and we're putting it up where we think it ought to be. Uh, it hadn't changed since 2004. You read through all the preambles, they'll talk about how they didn't use the right salary in 2004 when they switched from the short and long test to a single primary duty test. But regardless of where it is, you know, I read all 400 something pages of those proposed regs and everything else when they came out last summer. And the one sentence that stuck out to me was that uh, the the poverty level for a family of four in the United States is $24,000 something dollars. So it's higher than the minimum salary for an exempt employee. As soon as I read that, I was like, it doesn't really matter what else they say in here, this thing's going up. Um, and so what they were, so if you'll remember, the, the proposed regs were the 40th percentile of all salaried employees in the U.S. Now what they and 
employees, anyone paid on a salary basis, and they kind of took out some rural, rural areas, and it was all based on this Labor uh, Bureau statistics they have through the, with, with, in conjunction with the Census Bureau. But the bottom line was when we ran that calculation last July, it was going to, the projection was by this summer when the regs came out, it would be about $50,000. What they ended up doing was they, the country had, they have the country broken into four regions. They looked at the region that had the lowest salary uh, in the aggregate, which was the South, of course, and they based the 40 percentile on the South, and that's where we get the 47,476. Now, what they're going to do is, the, the proposal is to have the automatic increase, and that automatic increase is going to be every three years. So they will publish 150 days before the end of the calendar year. So in 2019, 150 days before the end of the year, they're going to publish the new salary. And it will be based on the 40 percentile of the lowest uh, region, which, let's be honest, is going to be the South again in three years. Uh, it's not never. It's not ever going to be the Northeast or the West. It, you know, the Midwest and the South could possibly change at some point. But I think in the next three years, it's probably still going to be the South. If you look at statistical analysis over the past six or seven years, which the Department of Labor did in the preamble to the regs, that's all the comments. Where they have to talk about the comments came in and why they didn't do this and why they did that. They estimate that by 2020, the minimum salary would be 51,000. I think it's 365 or something like that. So going up about three grand, a little over 3,200 bucks. Um, so again, I think we can expect every three years, unless the economy really tanks again or something, that we're going to have about a $3,000 increase. Um, so you can say that averages out to a thousand bucks basically a year. Um, so when you're doing your plan, you can think about that. But the reality is, uh, this is really sort of similar to a lot of states. If you operate in states that have a minimum wage tied to consumer price index, each year legislation looks at the consumer price index and decides whether the minimum wage is going up or whether it's going to stay the same in your particular state. Uh, anybody do business in a state that has one of those? Y'all wait yet? Okay. Well. What, I can tell you one thing, it doesn't ever go down. So once this goes to 47, 476, it isn't going to go back down. It's just a question of how much it's going to go up, and we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. So again, I've tried to memorize all this on close, but I'm not quite there. But the salary breaks down like this. It's 47,476 a year. Okay? That's 3,956 a month, uh, 1,978 month, semi-monthly. 18.26 bi-weekly and 9.13 a week. So let's let's remember, in order to be exempt, under, when we're talking about the executive, the administrative, and the professional, you got to get paid. A, you got to meet three tests. You got to be paid on a salary basis. You got to meet the minimum salary amount, and then you got to meet the primary duties test. Now, just because they didn't change the primary duties test, I'm not sitting up here telling you you don't have to worry about it. I'm just saying they didn't change it, so it stays the same. So, you know, the focus primarily is on the salary right now, but you still need to meet those. But in order to be paid, you know, a guaranteed salary, you do have to get that salary every week, regardless of the number of hours you work, except for some specific deductions that are authorized in the in the regulations. And I see people looking at me, so I'll go ahead and tell you what those are. Those are you can take full day deductions from example employees pay for a personal day. They want to go on a field trip or they want to go leave early and go on vacation for something. You, you can dock them a day's pay. Uh, if you have a sick plan, you can dock them a, sick, you know, a day for a sick plan. Now, if they have sick time, you're going to pay it and it's going to be the same. But if they run out and you have a sick plan, then you can actually dock them if they're absent from being sick. Uh, if they violate a safety violation, this is the only one you can actually do in a half day increment. So, like, if you had somebody who is exempt who violated a major safe policy, you could, if you wanted to suspend them for a day and a half and dock them a day and a half pay, you could do that. Every other one's got to be full day. The other one is a violation of a major, you know, policy. That's usually like your harassment policy or something like that. And you want to suspend somebody for a full day, you could, you could dock an exempt employee's pay. And then FMLA, if they're on FMLA, you just pay a percentage if they're doing intermediate. Eve, you know, if they're doing cancer treatment and they miss 
basically two afternoons, that'd be a full day. You pay them four fifths of their salary for that week. But you got to get paid the guaranteed salary with only those specific deductions. They got to meet the minimum salary amount and the primary duty test. So, as of December first, your exempt employees are going to have to make at least nine thirteen a week. Come you know, come December first. Um, so let's talk a little. Anybody have any questions about that? How we got here and that right? Part-time salary employee. Well, the part-time question we we've had this before. Here, here's the bottom line. This and this is important to recognize. In the past, because the minimum salary was so low, there were a lot of part-time employees. But unless you're going to pay them forty-seven thousand four seventy-six a year, they're not going to meet the salary test anymore. So you're just going to need to convert them out. I mean, you can pay them salary non-exempt or however you want to call it. But the bottom line is they're not going to be exempt, and you're going to have to track their time. Now, if they're part time, they're not going to work any overtime anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's just the you're going to have to tell them they got to start tracking their hours. And again, you know, I know there's a big thing about you know, you know, this big stigmatism or whatever it is that you know you just from a status standpoint I, the, the fact that I have to track my time is so degrading or whatever I sort of never really understood that I mean if you're in engineering or if you're in any kind of business where you're billing clients by the project or the time you got to track that time anyway so I mean lawyers I kind of have to track my time to every six minutes um, you know but you know it is what it is so it's fine but my point is you are going to have to when you're making these changes one of the big things you're going to Talk, think about is communication and employee relations issues. And, you know, I'll be quite honest, you've got sort of an easy out, which is you can just blame the government. You know, the bottom line is, hey, the government's changed the playing field. We've got to make some adjustments because of that. You know, you know you're going to have to start tracking your time now. And the good news is people in similar positions in similar industries where they're going to have kind of the same thing going on. I think once everybody sort of gets past this and we get into next year, I don't think it's going to be a huge deal because I think people who might be in similar jobs who used to be exempt that now may be non-exempt, you know, the friends and people they know are more than likely going to be doing the same thing and they'll be tracking their time. So I don't think it's going to be a huge deal. But I do think you need to think about it and I do think you need to communicate it in a way that it's a positive and hey, it now gives you an opportunity to earn, you know, overtime or you know, this this is what we have to do because of the new regs, and since you're part time, we can't afford to pay you forty seven thousand dollars a year, so we've got to track your time. Yes, ma'am. I think we have the opposite problem as well. Our, our supervisors in our plan are all over the limit. Yep. But they're going to be hearing about people who are just a hair under the limit at other places who get overtime now, and they're going to wonder why they're not. Yeah, did everybody hear that? You're going to have pressure you know, both ways. Pressure both ways. Did, did she said she may have some supervisors who are, are over the 47, but not by a lot. They're going to be exempt, but they may know some people elsewhere who aren't, who are now going to get overtime. Look, that's a problem that's always existed. You've got some supervisor, frontline managers out there working their butts off who are getting, you know, whatever it is, 45000 before, maybe dollars a year, maybe it's fifty. But you've got some of these high-paying, skilled labor jobs where they especially if you're in a union setting or something, and they're getting, you know, overtime and all, they're making $20,000 more than the manager is. I mean, that those issues have kind of always been there, so you just have to you know, address those the best you can. Um, not only are you going to have issues between different companies, but you're going to have issues within your own company. And one of the things I think you have to, employers have to do, uh, is you have to step back and look at this big picture. You know, I talk about buckets. First of all, there's... I like to use bucket, bucket one, two, and three. Bucket one is I got a few jobs that I'm going to have to either reclassify or bump the pay up, but it's a handful. It's eight or nine, so it's not a huge impact on my business. The middle is I got a decent number of jobs across different departments. I got to kind of figure out how I'm going to do this, and I got to figure out how to communicate that. And then bucket three is uh, this is going to impact me such that I may have to think about how I actually run my business and whether I'm going to start hiring more part-time employees, am I going to ask exempt employees to do more duties, you know, I may have to really rearrange how I'm running this business. So you need to figure out which bucket you're in. But you're right, ma'am, the compression is going to be a problem, not only within other uh, companies, but within your own company. I mean, I, the example I always give is senior engineer, junior engineer, senior accountant, junior accountant, whatever the position is. If you've got someone who's making 44000 right now, and you're going to bump them up to keep them exempt, that's great. But if you bump them up four grand to forty-eight, 
and the senior position above them is making 51 and there used to be a $7,000 gap, now there's a $3,000 gap, are you going to have an employee relations problem on your hand? I mean, you might, and there might not be anything you can do about it, but you're going to want to at least communicate that, hey, you know, we recognize, you know, you know, we're, we're trying to be fair in our pay, but we got to look at budgeting, and these positions really should be exempt positions, but we've got to raise the salary or we don't meet the test, and, you know, blaming the Department of Labor has changed the rules, and we got to comply with them, but you've got to figure out a way to sell that so you don't have an employee relations problems with your senior accountants or senior engineers, or you may have to look at bumping them up. At, maybe you don't bump them up the same, but bump them up another 1,000 so there's a little bit more of a you know, of a discrepancy between the two pay grades so you don't have senior and juniors, you know, working with a thousand dollar gap between them and the seniors wanting to know why in the world, you know, they're not getting uh, a little extra bump in pay. So those are things you're going to have to think about and then obviously you're going to have to think about those all within the context of what your overall budget is and what you can really afford to do. Um, so so that, that those are issues to look at. Um, let me address, I'll get in at the end sort of the things I think you need to talk about and what you need to be doing over the next six months. But let me talk again about um, this issue with the 10% incentive pay so that everybody can understand what this means. And I was on the phone with a client yesterday and we did all the math and so I figured I might as well bring my scratch piece of paper here to talk about it. Um, so what this means is there was a lot, this happened back in 2004, the last time they revised the reg. And what there was comments where people said, look, we need to be able to pay commissions and incentives toward the minimum salary. And what Department of Labor said is no, Department of Labor is real worried about the salary test getting watered down, people paying a small salary and then get trying to get, make it all up at the end of the year in bonuses or commissions and that defeats the whole purpose of getting a guaranteed salary and why you're exempt and everything else. And so the Department of Labor has been real resistant to that. Well, they got a lot of comments and feedback when they were going through having these, you know, they had some hearings and were getting feedback from various industries and they, you know, people started pushing this 10 well, some people wanted more than 10%, but they were pushing this, hey, let us use commissions and bonuses toward the minimum salary. So when the proposed reg came out, the Department of Labor said they are considering allowing bonuses but not commissions toward the 10%, up to 10% of the minimum salary. And when the final regs came out, the Department of Labor said, well, we've gotten feedback and comment. We determined there's a lot of industries where you have exempt employees who are not outside salespeople who are administratively exempt but get paid commissions and bonuses as part of their pay. And so we're willing to allow a piece of that to go to them salary, but we're going to cap it to 10%. Okay. And then they went a step further and said not only that, but you're going to have to pay that 10% uh, at least quarterly or more frequently. So what that means is, and I'm not a math guru, but so you got 913 a week. Well, I can do 10% of that. That's pretty much $91. I think we can all agree on that. And then you just take a monthly and the quarterly and you do the same thing. And what, you, what you're basically saying is you're going to have to pay a minimum salary of at least 9 90% of the 47,476, and then you have to pay that at least quarterly or more frequently. So that basically means every month or every quarter, they're going to have to at least get 90% of the guaranteed salary. So if you break that down, what that comes to is annually, and I told the client yesterday, let's give a little cushion, let's not get right on the dollar, but you know, if, if you do, it, it's basically, you're looking at about 42728 roughly, is 10 is 90% of the minimum salary at 47476 So what you could do is basically you could pay someone $43,000 a year and have either quarterly or monthly bonuses or commissions and use 10% of that and, you know, you'll get, you'll meet the minimum salary. Now, what I've told clients is, I, from a finance standpoint, I don't see a whole lot of benefit to this. You're not really saving money. I mean, maybe you do a few things on books, but since you have to pay quarterly, there's not a huge advantage. To me, it's just easier to give it all in the salary unless you already have a commission or bonus plan structure in place, and you now have the opportunity to use up the 10% of that to help you. And I was on the phone with a client who has one of those in place. 
And I said, okay, well, that makes sense for you. You can take advantage of that and structure it and see how it is. Um, my recommendation to clients is if you don't already have one, don't go try to put one in place just to you know, try to save 10% on the salary because you're paying it either way. you got to guarantee it because if you don't guarantee it, you're going to fail the minimum salary test. So you're really not saving anything. It was really proposed for those clients who already had these in place. We'll give them a little bone, if you will, to have 10% of that count toward the minimum salary. Um, so if you think about it, and this is where it can get real complicated, which is why I tell people I wouldn't go try to introduce a bonus or a commission plan just because the reg is 10 cents. I was on the client and I said, well, look, regardless of what this person does, whether they meet any of the performance criteria or not, you're going to have to pay at least 10% of that commission or bonus uh, every quarter or you're going to fail a test. And they were like, well, the way we have our structure, they will easily earn 10 If they do nothing, they'll earn more than 10%. I said, okay, you're good. But if, you're, if, you, if your bonus or commission plan is structured such that somebody could actually, you know, if they, don't, if they have a bad month or quarter, they might not earn anything, well, you're going to have to pay it anyway. So then what are you going to do? Are you going to treat that as a draw on future commissions and then try to take it away from future commissions? I mean, you could technically do it, but you're going to have to restructure your whole plan, and then somebody's going to have to spend time to figure all this out and calculate and make sure that, that the employees get the minimum salary, and I think at the end of the day, it's just unless you already have something in place. To me, it's just create more work for yourself. Yes, Rob. Sure. In a couple of your comments, you you've gone back and forth discussing either bonuses or commission. And in the I, in the view of these new regs, is there a disparity between the two? Can you clarify what that might? Yeah, be? yeah. I actually wrote a blog post yesterday. It wasn't so much what is commission, it was more what is not, or no, what is incentive pay, it was what is not incentive pay. Because uh, I've gotten some questions. In the preamble and all the comments, what the Department of Labor says is we historically have never allowed, you know, the value of benefits. So, you know, medical benefit, retirement, life insurance, whatever the complete package is, that's all fine, but it doesn't, doesn't impact minimum salary. Same thing with boarding lodging. There's some, you know, in the regs, depending on what your business is, you may provide housing or, or meals or something like that for employees. You can take the credit toward the minimum wage for that. They won't allow it toward the minimum salary for exempt employees. So even though they use the word incentive, the only thing that I can think of that you're really going to have is either a bonus or a commission. And it can be either one. It doesn't matter which one because they specifically in the regs allowed either one. Um, but it's, you're going to have to pay it. Now, the regs say non-discretionary bonuses. And what they mean by that is that, you know, they meet it, you got to pay it. I don't, sitting here today, I don't know that any DOL investigator would come in and actually say you didn't meet this test because your plan is technically called a non-discretionary bonus plan. I, I, I don't know if they'll be that technical, but, but the regs do say, or yours is discretionary, excuse me, but the regs do say non-discretionary plan. The bottom line is it doesn't really matter what you call it. If you're going to only pay 90% of the salary, then you're going to have to pay that 10% regardless of whether they meet any of the criteria or not. So, you know, the best way I've described it is if you're going to try to take advantage of this up to 10% on an incentive or a bonus, whether it's a commission or a bonus, just recognize that you're going to have to pay that. And if you don't, they fail the test. And it's, we don't have to worry about what their duties are. So, you know, my advice is, you know, if you've got a plan in place, you can use it, but I'd be careful with it because you don't want to have a situation where you haven't paid somebody. They are not going to let you make it up later at the end of the year. That's why the whole quarterly piece is here. And what the regs actually say is you've got to pay, you know, any any makeup or any any percentage of bonus or commission to meet the minimum salary has to be paid by the pay period after the end of the quarter. So you're going to have to pay it that very next pay period after the quarter. Now, if you're doing it monthly, it won't matter. Now, here's another question I got the other day from a client. Well, they don't talk about what the quarter is. Well, that's true, but the quarter is three months. We know that. Now, you can run it depending on how your business is. If you're a, you know, if you're a calendar year, that's pretty easy. If, you're, if your year starts October 1, then you run October 1, but you've got to be consistent. I don't think anybody wants to run different quarterly uh, quarters for employees, or you talk about a nightmare, that would be a nightmare. 
you know, some, some of y'all, how many of y'all have, like, vacation that runs from the anniversary date of the employee? Yeah, then you have to track it for each employee, which is a nightmare. I don't think you want to do that on commission plans or, or uh, bonus plans. It doesn't really make any sense. But you can pick whatever three-month quarter you want. Uh, the other thing I've told clients is, you know, recognize that most people are going to start, you know, January 1 with their quarterly thing. So my recommendation is when December rolls around, just pay them, make sure they get 913, I mean, whatever the, uh, what was the monthly salary, get 913 a week in December. Don't try, I wouldn't even mess with a 10% or an incentive or a bonus for one month out of a year. That's, to me, that's just more trouble to work. Uh, start, start it on January 1. I personally thought that you could have this November, December time frame. I, I even thought Department of Labor might go to January 1 because it would just make so much more sense and be administratively easier for clients not to have to worry about this new these new salary tests until January 1. I think the problem was the Department of Labor wanted these in place and effective before we had a new president, even though we'll know who it is. The new president won't really be in effect yet. I think they wanted it in effect in 2016, uh, but they're given six months for employers to kind of get in compliance. So I think that's important. Uh, one thing. I haven't talked about I do want to talk about the highly compensated employee exemption. Anybody know what that is? Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, it's not brand new, but <laughs> all right, so the highly compensated employee exemption, they introduced this in 2004, the last time they revised the regs. And what it basically said was if you were paid $100,000 a year, then and all you had to do is meet one test of the primary duty test. So for an executive employee, you've got to, you know, your primary job has to be managing or supervising a particular department uh, or business operation of the employer. You got to supervise two or more employees, and you got to have, you know, exercise. You got to uh, have the right on hiring and firing and making recommendations on hiring and firing. Well, if you're making hundred thousand dollars a year, you only have to meet one of those. You can make recommendations on hiring and firing, but not supervise two or more employees. I, the way I always described it is, it was sort of a Department of Labor is not going to look at you real hard if you're making hundred thousand dollars. They're just not worried about you. You're still supposed to meet one of the primary duty tests, but you know. Now they were not going to leave that there and bump the the regular salary up. So the highly compensated employee exemption has gone up to one hundred thirty-four thousand four dollars. So they based it on the ninetieth percentile. So your regular salary for exempt employees is at the fortieth percentile. Your highly compensated employees is at ninety percent. I don't want to confuse you, but there's a difference. With the normal salary, I'll call it regular salary, you have to, they got to get that, you know, that 47476 they got to get that annually, and they've got to get that amount at least quarterly. You can't make it all up at the end of the year. With the highly compensated employee exemption, you can. They, they have to make 913 a week. They have to at least make that, and if you're going to pay them $134,000, they're going to clearly make that. But you can have extra commissions, bonuses, or whatever you want, and if at the end of the year that gets them over $134,000, then you're going to meet the highly compensated employee exemption, and that's just another fallback exemption, another argument you can have to support exempt status. Now, I had a client, the first client that called me after these raises came out said, we're trying to figure out what to do. And I said, what's that? They said, well, I, you know, we're, we're a small, I can't remember, they were a construction client, I think, and they were like, our CFO only makes $122,000. We're trying to decide if we can afford to, you know, increase in $12,000 to be highly compensated employee exemption. And I said, well, why do you want to do that? And they're like, well, we, he, and I said, I said, your CFO is clearly exempt. You, you know, there's no question your CFO is exempt. I said, I don't, I would not chase the 134 number. If you ask somebody 132, then yeah, you might as well get them to 134, and you know, I'd worry about it. But I, you don't need to give somebody twelve thousand dollars to chase the highly compensated employee exemption. Use that money elsewhere <laughs> down for people who need to meet the regular salary. Um, so again, we still have the highly compensated employee exemption. They've increased that as well. They weren't going to, you know, not increase that while they're increasing the the, the, the normal salary. So it's one hundred thirty-four thousand dollars a year. That one does allow you to do a catch-up, if you will, at the end of the year. If you get to the end of the year and you've made $122,000 and you get a, a bonus or an incentive that takes you over to 134, then you meet the highly compensated employee exemption if you need it. But you can't do that with the regular salary. You've got to do that at least quarterly, as we've talked about.
Um, so that's, yes ma'am, that's one, one difference between the highly compensated employees and then the regular salary. So if, if you have someone, let's say it's at 120. Okay. As long as they need the regular salary primary duty test, then they're good. That's correct. The question was if they're if they're making one hundred twenty thousand, as long as they meet the primary duty test and they meet the minimum salary test, then they're good. The answer is yes. Correct. That's so why you know. So what's an example of a profession that wouldn't? Are you asking me why we have the highly compensated employee exemption, basically? Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I, I think you're right. It, it, again, it was a it was a fallback exemption, which is just another exemption. It, look, it's kind of like the tax code. We could make this all real simple, and I wouldn't have anything to do. And I'd say if you make X amount of money, it doesn't matter. You don't get overtime. Take the primary duty test out, take everything else out, and just have a. But you know, we're not going there. That's that's way too simple. Um, the highly compensated employee exemption to me is just a fallback. It's another way of saying if you make this amount of money, we're shortening the test. You only have to meet one primary duty test. But to me, what it says is the Department of Labor is not going to look at you. An investigator is not wasting any time on that. If anybody complains about that, if you want to pay, you know, Bob or Betty to sit at the desk and do nothing for $135,000, do it because. We'll fight about the primary duty test, but I don't think anybody's going to care about it. I mean, technically, they're going to need to meet one of them, but I've just sort of seen it as a, you know, you're going to wink, wink, we're not going to pay much attention to it. And when it was, and when it was at $100,000, you know, there were a decent number of people who made $100,000, but there's a good chunk of people who won't make one hundred thirty-four. dollars so that's why I'm just saying you got to look at your overall business. I just don't think you got to need to chase that 134 number, if that makes sense. All right, let's talk a little bit about what you ought to be doing right now. I already talked about the buckets, so I do think you need to figure out, you know, is my business in bucket one, two, or three? You know, how much of an impact? Like I talked to a client the other day and said, yeah, we got about four or five jobs we got to look at. Now, you can do that in a weekend. I mean, that's just not real complicated. Um, I got another client who told me they got, you know, 200 positions that they're trying to figure out what they want to do with. It's going to take a little bit longer, and you got to you got to look at the ripple effect of how either converting them or increasing their salary is going to have on other parts of your business. Now, the one thing I would say is you got to be realistic. I mean, if you say I'm going to have exempt employees do more, and they're already stretched as thin as they can be stretched, then you're going to have a real employee relations problem. So do be realistic about what you ask people to do. Um, here's what I think people are going to do. They're going to look at it and they're going to decide, okay, if somebody's making you know, $36,000, you know, are you going to give them a $11,000, $12,000 increase? I mean, depending on the business, depending on you know, whether they really should have had some increase in the last couple of years, maybe you are, but I, most people are going to be increasing those people who are around 42 to 40. You know, for those people you're going to look at hardly about, we'll just bump them up to 48 and keep them exempt. A lot of it also is going to have to do with how much overtime they work. I mean, if you've got people who are traveling or you got people who are working 50, 55 hours a week, you, you need to think about, you know, from a, from a cost standpoint, maybe it, it makes more sense from the model and the job dues they do to try to make them exempt. Um, but if you got somebody who's making $42,000 a year and they pretty much work nine to five and they don't work much overtime, then maybe you just want to convert them to non exempt, keep their pay right where they are, and you're not it's just you're not gonna have an issue. You're just gonna have to track their time now. So that is the important thing. Please remember, you know, exempt employees, you do not have a record keeping requirement. But if you convert them to non exempt or salary non exempt, you've got to you've got to track their time the same as anyone else who's entitled to overtime. All right. So then if you, if you, like we said, if you increase their pay, we talked about being careful on the compression issue. You know, the, the salary, you know, pay grade above or in that same position if you've got junior and senior or whatever, you know, are we having a compression issue that's going to cause us a problem? I mean, you may have one and you just need to figure out how you want to communicate it and deal with it. The, the second question, though, is if you convert people to non-exempt, then you have to figure out from a budget standpoint, are you going to pay them what they've been paid now and pay them overtime? Or are you going to reduce their pay rate 
with the anticipated overtime so that they will basically net out the same amount of money at the end of next year. And that's a business decision you have to make. But once you make that decision, depending on which decision you make, you've got to figure out the best communication to your employees so they don't feel like they're getting bullied or cheated by you know, So you want to put a positive spin on it either way. You know, look, we, we can only afford, you know, to pay whatever this position is, you know, $45,000. We, we just can't afford to increase it $3,000. Um, so we're going to reduce your pay. But you're going to work, you're now going to be entitled to overtime, and, you, and you're going to work overtime. But again, we've got it budgeted just at this amount, so we're reducing your, your, your normal rate. Your hourly rate's going to be X. But we anticipate you're going to work 200 hours of overtime next year, so you'll make essentially the same amount of money. So it's it, it's it's a wash. It's a net zero. But we've got to make this change because the Department of Labor's changed the regulations, and we don't really have a choice. And you know, you you, may, you can make the DOL the bad guy if you want, but you've got to, you got to figure out the positive spin you're going to put on it. Or if you're going to allow them to keep their pay, then that's a real positive spin. Hey, you know. Now that these new regs have come out, they changed sort of the playing field. You get the opportunity to earn overtime. Now you're gonna to have to track your time. I know, but look, it's not that big a deal. You're gonna track your time the same as everybody else. Um, I've talked to some clients. If you want, if you have these people that were in exempt positions before, that you want to have a different method for them to track their time. Maybe they do it on the computer instead of Chromeus, or they do something different so it looks like you know they're. Being being treated a little different or special, you know, you can you can do any of that kind of stuff you want. But the bottom line is they're going to track their time. Hey, we're going to keep your rate at the pay it is, and you're going to have the opportunity to earn overtime. So you're actually going to have the opportunity to earn more money next year. I mean, that's a, hey, take advantage of that. That's the sales, you know, that, you're going to come out looking good with those people. Uh, but if you're doing that to one group and you're doing the other to another, you just got to be careful how you communicate it because they'll start talking to each other. So. You know, depending on whether it's different locations or different regions of the country or what it is, you know, you just want to be, you want to think big picture about how is this communication going to go, not only with this group, but how is it going to go with that other group when they talk, because you know they're going to talk. Um, so those, you know, those are some issues you got to think about. Again, you know, like I said, I, some businesses may start hiring more part-time employees. You know, they may say, look, we're going to hire some more people. We're going to, they're going to be part-time. We're going to pay them whatever hourly rate we're going to pay them. We're not going to have to worry about overtime because they're part-time employees. And in fact, if they're less than 30 hours, we're not even going to have to worry about Affordable Care Act. So, you know, we may just, we may take these positions that used to be exempt keep one person exempt, hire some more part-times, and get the job done. I mean, there, there's all kind of options out there, and you've got six months to sort of figure them out. So, you know, that's the one thing I will say is take, take the time to try to figure those out. Um, I'm glad to see somebody else uses the same one I use. I thought it was mine. Um, <laughs> so uh, another thing to think about is when you're, you know, when, before the final regs came out, we thought this was going to be every year. And if you were going to look at an adjustment every year, then what I was telling people is if you're stretching to get to whatever the new minimum salary is, and you know it's going to go up again the next year, and then the next, and then the next, you've you got to figure out, you know, are we really able to stretch two or three years? Because if we're not, what's the point of stretching one year and then converting? Now that we have the three years, I really do think this is beneficial to employers because you may say, look, I'm going to take these people up 48. And we'll keep them exempt. We'll see how this goes, and know that you've got a three-year, you know, sort of cushion, if you will, to work with. And who knows what happens with your business in three years? And then when, you, when we get to 2020, depending on where it goes, let's say it goes to 52, you may say, ah, you know, I don't know that I want to take these people to 52. Maybe we convert them to non-exempt, and they do. That's, that's great. Um, so at least you got three years to help you make that decision. Because I do think there were some employers who are probably thinking, all right, this group of people, we're not really, we're not going to stretch to 50, especially if we might have to go to 51 or 52 the next year. Um, now that they know it's 47, 476, and they got three years before they have to worry about it going up again, some of those clients may say, well, now that group, I, maybe I will take that group 48. Um, so again, just, you, you need to think about all that stuff. At the end of the day, the, the, the regs are not that complicated from the standpoint of their, you know, 15, 12 pages, but 
you have to think about how it impacts your entire business because what you do with one group of employees, if you do something different with another group of employees, you know what kind, you know what kind of chemistry is that going to create in your workforce? Are you are we going to have employee relations issues? I would, I'm always more concerned about the potential employee relations issues than I am everything else. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but the math is what it is. You're either going to have to pay them the 47476, or you're going to have to convert them to non-exempt. I mean, that the math is what it is. To me, the question is, how is it going to impact your workers? Uh, you know, how is it going to impact the changes you make within the workforce? And you know, keeping some harmony and, and keeping, especially if you've got good employee relations in your workforce, you don't want this to, you know, to 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 ruin that. Yes, sir. We're a nonprofit. Can you verify that this uh, does not impact clergy and teachers? I can verify it does not impact clergy and teachers. I cannot verify that it does not impact all nonprofits. Um, everything that was there before is still there. So let me let me I see a question. I'm gonna get you. So, for example, let me start with this. Outside sales. This does not impact outside sales. Okay. Outside sales doesn't have to meet the guaranteed salary. Never did. So as long as you're truly outside sales, as long as you meet the primary duty, you're out of the office making sales at least. You know, 50, more than 50% of the time. That's your primary duty. You can pay that person a salary plus commissions, pay straight commissions, you can pay hourly, you can do whatever you want with it. The computer professional exemption has gone up, the minimum salary has gone up, but they have not moved the hourly rate. For, the, for those of y'all that have computer professional exempt employees, remember there's an hourly rate of 23, $23.47, I think. Twenty-three dollars and forty-seven cents, which is still below the four, or above the forty-seven four seventy-six right now. So you can still pay your computer professional exemptions at hourly rate if you want. The other exemptions, like the professional exemption, teachers, lawyers, some the clergy and, and law uh, physicians, lawyers, teachers, clergy, they don't have to meet the guarantee. There is no salary test for them, and we're not protected. Basically. They can pay me whatever I want, and I can't go complain to anybody. Yes, sir. How about engineers? No, engineers, there's no, there's no exception for engineers. I mean, engineers meet the professional exemption, but they've got to be paid the guaranteed salary. So if you've got an engineer, they're going to have to make 47476 come December 1. So what I'm saying is the only thing this does not impact is anybody who didn't have to meet the salary before, they still don't have to meet it after December 1. So that would be outside sales, lawyers, doctors, teachers, and you're right on the clergy. But this is going to hit nonprofits and government bad. I mean, there's no question about it. And and you know, there was talk, there were a lot of comments about Harvin, you know, out and not having this apply to nonprofits and government entities. And the problem with that is it's a slippery slope. Once they start carving you know, industries out, then it's it's never going to stop. So I think that's why they, they didn't do it. If you read the comments there, their at least explanation is we don't think it's necessary for a separate rule on nonprofits. We use the 40th percentile of the South to give the lower salary. Let's be honest, it only helped you by three grand. But to give the lower salary as opposed to the, the salary of the entire country. And so we think that's enough and there doesn't need to be a special rule for nonprofits. So, you know, you look at like the city and the county. I mean, any manager who's currently exempt, you know, we probably got a lot of county managers who are making city managers who may be making, I don't know, 30, 38, 35, 40, 42,000. I mean, they're either going to non exempt or they're going to have to go up to 48,000. There's no special, you know, car out for them come December 1st. Yes, ma'am. So I'm a big nonprofit. I'm in a situation we have a small preschool. Two teachers and the director on salary. So now the director's going to have to keep up to the time. That, that's that's correct. I mean, depending on how small it is, if the director doesn't make forty-seven thousand, I don't I don't think the director is going to be covered. And you can look at it closer. The, the the regulations do have an exception for teachers and I think administrators. So I think like the principal and assistant principal of the school. I don't think they have to meet the minimum salary test. I, a, a director of a preschool, I don't know. You might can make that argument. I, I don't know. You might want to look at it. But go on the Department of Labor website under the salary test and look for the 
where it'll say where it'll be under section 541 it'll say where it doesn't apply and it talks about lawyers physicians and teachers and i think it says teachers and school administrators i've never looked close enough to know how they define school administrators i've always assumed that's a principal but i mean i i don't know yes sir. Chuck, um, you want to talk about benefits and possible different benefit classification? Yeah. Yeah. So, a benefits question, which is a great question, and um, I talked about that last time. So, when you reclassify, if you reclassify employees, if you're saying, look, this, is, let's just take it assistant manager. So that's the easiest. Whether you're in the restaurant industry or whatever you're in, let's just say you got, you know, 50 assistant managers, um, and you're gonna have to reclassify those assistant managers because you can't you can't take them all up to forty eight thousand. All right, but you say, look, we want to you know those assistant managers had certain benefits as exempt employee. They got life insurance. They got additional you know medical or we paid an additional premium or what whatever it was. We'd like for them to keep that. The simple fact that we're taking them to non exempt is not because they did anything wrong or we changed their duties. It's because you know the government increased the minimum salary. All, you can certainly keep them and give them the same benefits they had, but you're going to have to amend your plan. Now, you've got six months. You've got plenty of time to do it. So what you're going to have to do is either go in and amend your plan to include this new job category you're going to create, um, you know, or something like that. I think you're, it all depends on your business. Some businesses are going to create new pay groups. Some may create entirely new job positions. You may have, you know, exempt managers, non-exempt managers. Hourly supervisor, you know, supervisor, whatever you want to call it, supervisor A, supervisor B, whatever you want to call it. And if you create a new position, you may just need to amend your plans to include that new position if you want them to get certain enhanced benefits. Um, obviously, you have to still be careful with the non-discrimination rules and all that. But if they were getting it beforehand, you should be fine. All you're doing now is trying to keep them, you know, you're trying to keep them in the place they were before these new regs. Uh, take effect. So, great question, Jerry. Yes, sir, Rob. Chuck, we've had a couple of organizations that have come to us and said that they are taking the structure. We're bringing in new associates at 48, but we're basing that on a 45 or a 50 hour week. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so they're bringing in new associates, going to pay them 48,000, but on the basis of a 45 hour week. But are they treating them as exempt or not? They have to track their hours. <laughs> are we, you haven't helped me. Are they are they are they taking the position they're owed overtime or not? And the way it's been explained so far is that the assumption is you are going to work X amount of overtime per week, and the expectation all is right. that you will work X amount of overtime. Okay, all right. And I think I understand the question. So let me repeat it because there's two ways you can do this. There are ways to try to get around. Get around. Not the right word. It sounds bad. But there are there there are. There are things in the regs that allow you to pay employees a little differently that you can benefit yourself. One of them is a fluctuating work week. The Department of Labor does not like fluctuating work week. They've done everything they can to, to try to discourage people from using it, but it's in the law, and so they have to work with it. What the, what the fluctuating work week basically says is, I've got an employee here who doesn't meet the primary duty test. They're basically, you know, they're not exempt because they don't meet the test, but I'm going to pay them like an exempt employee. So I'm going to pay you a guaranteed salary. Let's say it's $500 a week. And I hope you, but you're getting that salary regardless of the number of hours you work. So we go back to the same deduction rules I just talked about earlier. You've got to treat them like an exempt employee. And that, that $500 a week is going to cover 38 hours, 40 hours, 42 hours, 45 hours. That's your straight time pay regardless of how many hours you work that week. And if you work over 40, then I'm going to pay you a half-time premium. Okay, so what that means is instead of paying you, if you make $10 an hour, instead of paying you $15 an hour, I'm just going to pay you $5 because the $10 is already included in that $500. So uh, the more hours you work, your hourly rate goes down. That's the trick with it. So you got to be careful. Employees who know that don't like it. The regs say that you can pay a fluctuating work week, but you have to have an agreement with the employee. 
and the employee's understanding, which is why I recommend it be in writing and initial by the employee. Now, it doesn't have to be a contract. I'm talking about a one-paragraph thing that says, Bob Smith will be paid on a fluctuating work week basis. This means that regardless of the number of hours that Bob works, he's going to get $500 a week, and any overtime he will get will be based on half-time premium of his regular rate pay. Because depending on whether they work 42 or 48, the rate's going to be smaller at 48 and higher at 42. So you've got to recalculate that that rate. It's a blended rate, and you'll figure out what it is. That's one option. The option you're talking about, Rob, is, oh, one more thing on the fluctuating work week. This will tell you how much the Department of Labor doesn't like it. In, in the 2011 regs, they made a few tweaks in 2011. They were so small, most people didn't even know that they even happened. Um, in their commentary, they said, as we have historically said, any compensation paid in addition to the fluctuating work week will invalidate the fluctuating work week method of payment. So from the Department of Labor standpoint, is if you're going to pay this fluctuating work week, they're not going to allow you to pay non-exempt employees bonuses or commissions because they'll say it defeats the, the, the fluctuating work week. And they're doing that because they don't like it, let's be honest. But what they're saying is they don't want people to pay this real small fluctuating work week and give a huge amount of bonus and get away, and get away with, you know, this smaller hourly, you know, rate they're paying. All right, Rob, what you were talking about is some clients, and you have to be very careful here, are paying a salary for a specific amount of hours and want to say that it includes your overtime. I don't really like that because you're not saving any money. If I say I'm going to pay you 45, I'm going to pay you X dollars, and it represents 40 hours at $10 and 4 hours at $15, and I'm going to pay you that salary for the week, the math's still the same. I mean, I, you're not saving anything. Is saying $10 an hour, and I'll pay you, and I'll pay you your overtime when you work it. But some people want to do it. You got to be real careful there because the Department of Labor will not let you take advantage of paying more money or additional pay to go toward overtime unless it's clear that it was done that way. So what you have to do is say, I'm hiring you. Uh, I'm hiring you to do the XX job, okay? And this job is going to be paid. This job, your rate of pay is going to be X, um, and I'm going to pay you a weekly salary of Y. And that salary includes 40 hours at blank and five hours at the overtime rate. You, you can do that. But again, at the end of the day, from a finance standpoint, you're paying the same amount of money. What you can't say is, I'm going to pay you $500 for 45 hours and not pay you any overtime. I mean, you can't do that unless they're exempt. If that's the case, they're exempt, and it doesn't really matter how many hours. You work them as many hours as you want. So you can do that. You can build in you know, a rate and say it includes overtime, but that built-in rate has to be time and a half, whatever the first 40 hours is, so it's it's basically the same thing. And you really need that in writing because you won't be able to say it after the fact. I've, I've had a lot of investigations, lawsuits, where clients will try to say, well, yeah, I mean, we paid them $400 a week, but the, the expectation was they would work 44 hours a week and it had four hours of overtime built in. And I'm like, that's nice, but unless you got something in the writing, Department of Labor is going to say, uh, nice try, no. You know, you owe, you owe overtime for those four hours. So you got you can do that, Rob, but it needs to be in writing. And at the end of the day, the, you're really not, I mean, the math is the same. You can do it if you want, but to me, the math is the same. <coughs> yes, sir? Is it overtime calculated as a multiplier, like 1.5? Yeah, okay, so, so overtime is time and a half. It's 1.5. So, you know, but... but but here's what's important. Overtime has to be paid at 1.5 times the employee's regular rate of pay. So when you talk about the regular rate of pay, Department of Labor says it's all remuneration that's paid for that work. So if I make 10 bucks an hour, then it's 15. It's easy math. But some people work a piece rate or they work multiple jobs. I may get $10 an hour for this job and I get $14 an hour for that job. Well, you have to take all the hours I work, you got to take the total pay, divide it, and figure out my new regular rate. Because my regular rate, you know, if I work ten, if I work five hours at ten dollars, five hours at fourteen dollars, well, that's pretty easy math. The rate's twelve. But if I work two hours at ten dollars an hour and I work twenty hours at fourteen dollars an hour, then it's some variation percentage in there in between. 
So you, you have to take the entire remuneration, divide it by the total hours, that will include 44 or whatever, and figure out the new rate, and that's what you owe the overtime. So again, if you're just paid one hourly rate, it's, it's easy math, it's not a big deal. But if you're paid at different rates, or you're getting commissions or bonuses that are tied to your performance or your production, then all that has to be included in in calculating overtime. Make sense? Yeah, until you go to California, and then you pay daily, and then sometimes you pay double time. Um, but that, yeah, so, you know, again, I, it's, I think the biggest decision y'all have to make as employers is figuring out how many jobs are impacted by this. Now, one thing I do want to do, I don't know how we're doing on time. Oh, well, we're about out, so let me wrap it this way. One thing I will do, turn everything off for the YouTube people, is... This is a good time for you to look at your all your jobs. Because if y'all all know, how many of y'all, y'all, how many of y'all are HR? Most all y'all in here? Look, y'all know you got jobs classified that you're like, I don't know if that's a real exempt job. Well, you know what everybody says when they call me? They're like, We ain't got a job, we think we need to reclassify. How do we do it without raising any red flags? Well, the way you do it is you try to do it around, you know, a new rollout of a compensation plan or we're we're re, re, re Rechanging jobs, we're rolling out new jobs, scriptures, anything you can do where people don't go, does that mean I should have been getting overtime this entire time? You know, that's what you want to try to avoid. So all I'm saying is the Department of Labor is giving you this big umbrella, okay? So if there are jobs that you need to look at seriously and maybe think about changing, go ahead and do them now because this is the perfect um, sort of umbrella to try to do it without raising a bunch of red flags because most of employees aren't going to know whether their job was changed or reclassified specifically because of the changes in the reg or whether we're just doing it because it's good from a timing standpoint now's a good time to do it so you know what you say is hey you know department of labor has, has changed these regs have come out we've they've changed the way the exemptions work we're looking at a bunch of jobs we're going to do some restructuring we're doing pay grade differences and we're going to roll this stuff all out and if you got a couple of jobs that you're think you would be really should be non-exempt then now's a great time to convert them and when they say well why'd you change my job we say well we changed it because of the you know the red we we're doing a whole review of all our jobs and we made decision this job really going forward because of the changes that department of labor made should be a non-exempt job they're not going to go back and read the regs and go you know what actually you know i don't know that you really changed mine because of that i mean some of them could but my point is you've got a perfect opportunity now to look at all your jobs, and if you've got a couple that you're unsure about, regardless of the 47, 476, now's a good time to make it and just make this, this transition and this change all at the same time, and hopefully it doesn't, you know, doesn't raise a bunch of questions from your employees. It'll all get sweeped into this is all the big change that everybody's making because all your competitors and your people who, your, their friends who are working at other businesses, they're all going to be going through the same thing at the same time so people are not going to be like surprised by what's going on um, so it does give a good opportunity for you to look at your workforce and say hey if there's a couple of jobs here we all kind of clean up now we to clean that up thank y'all for y'all's time thanks everyone uh, so chuck thank you for joining us chuck has joined us several times so um, we, uh, I'd like to introduce John Knight. Uh, we typically end right at 9.30, so it's a hard stop, but we stay after, so if you have any questions, Chuck will be here and can answer any questions. So I came for free legal advice, and I'm sure several people <laughs> did as well. So, um, okay. well, thanks, Chuck. I appreciate you presenting that, and uh, I look forward to your next session when I hear the heart about how the temporary yeah. staffing industry is carved out. Um, <laughs> So definitely want to thank you for coming, and we have some folders outside for all of you that attended with just some information on the company, but if you're not familiar with Human Technologies, uh, we are a human resource service company. We provide workforce solutions through our people, and uh, today was provided by our organizational solutions group, Jen heads up. So if you're not familiar with that, which I believe everyone is, uh, Jen, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, organizational solutions, we're an HR consulting division for human technology. So most of you know about our staffing 
side, or a manufacturing solution side. This side is more of an HR consulting solution for organizations outside of human technology. So most of you in the room, I, I know of. So thank you for joining. Today is just an example of what Jim does. On behalf of all of the employees of human technology, Thank you for coming, and hopefully we look forward to seeing you next time. And we hear about this carbon. <laughs> <laughs>